I'd like to call to order meeting of the Community Development Committee for Metropolitan Council for April 16th. Uh, welcome to members of the public and our staff. We have a unique circumstance um, this afternoon due to some illnesses and travel complications. We're not going to have a quorum for a meeting this afternoon. Um, the good news is we can move directly to our information items, which um, are also significant. So why don't we start with the uh, discussion about regional, uh, excuse me, recreation activities and facilities for the 2040 Regional Parks Plan, Parks Policy Plan update. John. Yes. Question Councilman for Dorfman. those items that we were scheduled to vote on today we will see them come back to us when? Councilman Dorfman, my expectation is um, in two weeks. Okay, so not, none of these need to go straight to the council without a recommendation. Uh, Mr. Chair, council members, we will look in and see if anything is time sensitive relating to the budget amendment or master plans, mm -hmm. um, but certainly anything that requires CDC approval would be waiting until the first meeting in May, which I believe is actually on May 7th. So that's actually okay. three weeks. Because we had the same calendar. situation with transportation, <coughs> transportation last week, and so a whole bunch of things just went straight to the council. Mm -hmm. I would prefer, you know, a number of these things I think would be good to have some, some discussion here at CDC if we can, so. Okay, okay. good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Emmett Mullen and I'm the Regional Parks Manager and I am with... I'm Dan Markell, uh, Planning Analyst in Community Development. Um, and today we're here to talk about the Regional Parks Policy Plan update and um, specifically uh, recreation activities and facilities policy. Um, so this topic is found in chapter four of the Regional Parks Policy Plan. And um, this is um, one um, that really um, gets at the heart of uh, the Metropolitan Regional Park System. It is what defines uh, the activities and the eligible activities and facilities. Um, as an introduction um, to our discussion today, uh, because we would like to have a high level discussion, uh, we wanna share a little bit about what we've been hearing um, from um, our different engagements, whether at the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission, um, the, in our conversations with the regional park implementing agencies or other engagement. Um, and then we'll ask uh, for your insights if you um, have uh, a desire to share. Um, so the uh, regional um, parks policy plan, we've sort of broken up into four broad areas to update. Um, the first is uh, we're updating um, the plan because it is a statutory requirement. It's, it's required in law. And uh, there are a few very specific elements that we must address, including the estimate, the cost estimate to build out the entire system. That's one of the examples of, of the things we have to do. Um, we also have to respond to some legislation that passed uh, during the last um, legislative session, the 2017 legislative session. Um, there's just a general desire to clarify, modify, and strengthen language. And then finally, there's just a host of other areas. One example is we're gonna move some of the administrative guidance um, in the grant program um, kind of operational part of the manual, and we're gonna pull it forward into um, a grant program uh, guide, like an implementation guide. So today, uh the way we're gonna organize the discussion is uh, we'll give you an overview of the current uh, language about recreational activity and facilities. Uh, we're gonna share some of the insights we've had from the various groups we've talked to uh, about this topic other time, uh, over time. Uh, we have luckily one of our council member work group members here in the room today. Uh, We've talked to implementing agencies. We've talked to uh, MPOSC, Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission. 
and then we've had a variety of other um, interactions with folks uh, uh, through community engagement uh, over time. And then we'll be talking about the overall policy. There's four strategies, and we'll just march through the four strategies. Um, so here is uh, the recreation <coughs> facility and activity policy. Um, and it is just simply uh, provide a regional system of recreation opportunities for all residents while maintaining the integrity of the natural resource base within the regional parks system. And then there's four strategies within this part of the plan. Um, the first one is around how activities need to be tied to uh, the natural resources of the parks, but not adversely affect them. Uh, the second strategy is around most heavy recreational use should be accommodated in the more urban regional parks. Uh, the third strategy is around strengthening equitable use of regional parks and trails among all residents across race, ethnicity, income, and ability. And then finally, the fourth strategy uh, we're going to discuss today is bicycle and pedestrian facilities should be coordinated between the regional park system and the transportation system. So just a little bit of an insert in the middle here. Um, we do have this council member work group um, with Harry Melander, uh, Wendy Wolf, and Steve Elkins, um, who we meet with approximately monthly to kind of update and give sort of early guidance in terms of where the policy plan updates go. And this isn't on this slide here, but I just wanted to put a sort of big, some big uh, uh, sort of boundaries on how we're approaching the update. Uh, first of all, this is an update to a plan. It's not a rewrite of the plan. Uh, so the intention is to clarify what's in the plan, to bring language up to date, and to, to basically uh, reaffirm the council's commitment to the regional park system as a place, places that are great, large, natural focused places uh, and uh, that serve a regional audience. So places where lots of people from across the region come and come uh, uh, recreate. The other, th the other dynamic that the council members have, have uh, given us is you may have heard we have an election coming up in the in the fall. Um, we're doing this update prior to the election. The uh, the the will of the council is not to make any major changes in the direction of the regional parks policy plan that would encumber the next council, whoever that may be. So, more or less, um, keep the system going as it is, tweak it, update it as needed and as uh, as necessary. Thanks, Dan. Oops. Um, so uh, the first strategy, now we're just going to kind of walk through them. And the idea is if anyone wants to ask questions or um, or uh, make comments, uh, we're, we're going to kind of do that on a strategy by strategy basis. Um, the first one, again, is activities in regional parks must be tied to natural resources of the parks, but not adversely affect them. So, so that's the first strategy. Some of the discussion highlights that we've heard to date, uh, it's just a recognition that outdoor recreation opportunities in the regional park system depend on the high quality natural resource base. So it, it recognizes that we have a kind of shared values, but also a tension between the natural resource base and the recreational activities. And the uh, um, idea that you can separate those two things and be in a regional park isn't, isn't realistic, that these, um, these um, exist together, um, the, the provision of opportunities and conservation. Um, there's an interest, particularly from the park agencies, to move to more of a performance-based system, so, so um, to, to evaluate whether an activity is appropriate. Um, so it isn't, it isn't so much whether, it's more about how um, the, the opportunity is provided. So um, the idea that um, parking lots in a regional park system should be developed and designed to a certain standard that will be sensitive to the natural resource base. That's, that's just sort of a, a 
black and white example of you know how we do need parking facilities in these places, but we should do so with a real sensitivity. Um, there's also a desire in the strategy to uh, remove out-of-date language. Like the current plan talks a lot about inline skating is this new and exciting opportunity. And, well, that's sort of been out there for a while now. The innovations of Hacky Sack. <laughs> um, any questions about that dynamic or uh, the tension that exists between the provision of um, um, recreational opportunities and the conservation of natural resources? I mean, I have a question. The, the example that you used, which I think is instructive about how do you provide for car parking or other kinds of parking um, in a way that's sensitive to the setting. Um, can you describe how we would use a more flexible performance-based system in that kind of example? Because once it's in place, it's a little challenging to measure its performance. I mean, are we talking about utilization and then thinking about mm -hmm. how do you pivot or reduce the size of that if needed? Uh, can you just describe in yeah. detail how that that example plays out? That's a that's a great question. And let me just start by saying um, we're we're looking to move toward a, a more flexible performance based system, but we're not really ready to leave the list of eligible activities yet. Um, so, so one of the things the plan says is that list of activities has served us well for the first 40 years of this system. Um, but uh, so, so one way a performance-based system um, might work is um, take, for instance, the parking lot example. Um, one of the things that um, the the first performance-based standard might say is, you know, to the best of um, your ability mitigate impacts to high quality uh, natural resources. So maybe maybe the parking lot would actually get sited in an area that was away from water, that was away from some of the more high quality um, um, settings in the park. Um, there, there's uh, clearly um, the park system is, is being um, developed in an urban and urbanizing area. And so we're often working in disturbed environments. And so maybe you're looking to site a parking lot in, in those more disturbed areas. That's that's one example. Mm -hmm. I hope Thank you. Mr. Chair. Or Dorfman. So the issue that seems to come to us more often that gets at this careful balance is the question of bike and ped trails through the regional parks. So how do you see I mean, how do we weigh yeah. those things in order to maintain sort of this balance? Uh, great question, Council Member Dorfman and, and uh, Mr. Chair. The, um, so I would imagine that oftentimes, particularly in the more, or more urban parts of our system, we do have um, regional trails that move through uh, uh, units like regional parks uh, in the system and that they play a really essential role in the commuting infrastructure of the of the region. Um, my sense is that um, if we were looking to develop um, a regional uh, bike trail uh, through an area, we would want to put it on the on the um, edge or the periphery of the regional trail, potentially, uh, or uh, looking at moving it through an area that has already um, underwent some level of disturbance that you would really try to keep it away from some of the more um, um, high quality natural resources. And I just wanna say that that's, that's sometimes an option. Sometimes you get into those pinch, pinch points where that is not, um, possible to accommodate but well and i would just say so it's an interesting issue around head <coughs> because that's also a recreational opportunity mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a, a different purpose it, it's not necessarily a commuter um and and so that sort of balance of this is a recreational amenity versus and then but shouldn't adversely impact the natural resources i, I mean it's it's tricky um, in terms of looking at that issue. And I'll just 
close by making stating the obvious is that uh, a lot of uh, the residents of our metropolitan region really want to ride their bicycle the to and through a regional park. And they look at that as a form of important access to uh, the regional park system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the idea that there will need to be some um, careful uh, balance um, decisions made is, is critical. Thank you. So I'm, uh, the next strategy is, is just most heavy recreational use. Um, should occur in the more urban uh, regional parks. And, you know, this has always been a little bit of uh, in my, stuck in my craw, but, but the, some of the comments that from the agencies went along, when, when you read the, the text within uh, this strategy, it really talks about the spectrum of uh, opportunities through the system. And it says, you know, heavy use uh, or, areas uh, should occur in, in the, some of the more urban or developed parts of the system where, um, you know, more nature-based uh, sensitive uh, or, or lighter use areas should should occur in um, low impact areas or, or but, but also recognizing that, um, that um, this spectrum doesn't always match the pattern of urbanization. Like there, there was a, an example that came up during the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission meeting. And I think it was Council Member Wolf who brought it up, who talked about uh, Lake Billsby uh, Regional Park, which is a pretty new regional park in the southern part of Dakota County. And, and that, that um, they're really looking to develop some beach facilities that um, will provide uh, water uh, opportunities for, for you know, the region and, um, and that that be appropriate, even though it is on the periphery of the system. Dan, anything else in that one? No, I, th I think one of the, well, I guess yes then. Uh, one of the things that I think is unique about our system is we have some regional parks that are highly urbanized areas. We have some regional parks and park preserves that are highly not urbanized areas. And as we go forward, uh, one of the things that is always a, another balance point is uh, what do we expect out of the various, various parks that we have? How urban should they appear? How natural should they appear? We know that overall they need to highlight the natural place, um, but we just have a whole lot more people around some of them we have a whole fewer people around some. So the, the implementing agencies were um, really quite articulate about saying, we need to make sure that across all the regional parks, across all the agencies, we have a full spectrum of activities that's possible. And that that's the, that's the kind of guideline that they would operate by for overall system performance. Um, I didn't hear anybody volunteering to have the monster truck pit um, <laughs> recreational facility. And I don't think that would quite qualify as natural, but uh, uh, in terms of mountain biking trails and perhaps off-road vehicles and all kinds of things that, uh, that historically haven't been part of the regional parks, um, there's, there's a range of activities um, all the way to the I'm sorry, the thing I just learned about, which is the paint, the uh, uh, 5K where they throw color at you and uh, turn you into different uh, rainbow colors. Um, we don't see many of those out in Lake Billingsby, but we see quite a few of them uh, at Coble Park. Mm -hmm. So there's a range of opportunities that they're providing. Strategy three, Dan. So strategy three is... is uh, really one of the newer pieces of text in the plan to date. It really got inserted during uh, the 2014 uh, writing of this plan, strengthen equitable usage of regional parks and trails uh, among all residents across race, ethnicity, race, ethnicity income, and ability. Um, the language is pretty fresh still. There were, there were uh, 12 or 13 different strategies that were outlined in the 2014 um, uh, plan. And by and large, there was 
the, quite a bit of support for all those strategies still, with a couple of exceptions. The legislature gave us uh, some fairly explicit direction that um, uh, council prioritization of projects for uh, uh, legacy projects uh, wasn't really going to be something the council was in the business of doing anymore. The legislature gave us that instruction. And so the one of the questions coming into this update was, what is the status of the council on prioritizing projects that are funded through the council's uh, CIP process? And we had a long, a bunch of long discussions with the implementing agencies about that discussion, uh, knowing that the, the legislature might be interested in that topic. What we really ended up talking with the implementing agencies was that the purpose of the project prioritization was still held by everyone. The goal of that prioritization was important, that we were trying as a group to increase the equitable use of the facilities. And in talking this through, what the agencies were able to clearly say is that some of the techniques we were trying to apply at the project prioritization level were better approached at the master plan level or at the earlier phases of the, of the funding uh, for different parts of the parks. And so we're talking about um, instead of using the existing equity toolkit simply to screen projects and organize them. What we're talking about doing now is having a slightly altered equity tool of some sort to, to uh, ensure that equitable use is being pursued and advanced in project grants as they come forward. And then using something like the equity toolkit for new project master plans that would come down the pipe and be funded, you know, in the next, in say the next decade or so. So we've refined the approach towards uh, pursuing equitable use uh, in a way that I think the, the agencies um, uh, had some real good input on. And I think it's a more targeted use of the effort that's available uh, both from us and from the, um, all the different parties involved. So that felt pretty good. So I think the the intention, more or less, is that uh, we're not going to be pursuing project prioritization through the council's CIP process, but that we have all these new ways of pursuing equitable use, uh, sort of as a trade for that, essentially, or as a clarification amongst that. Um, that was kind of a long explanation. Maybe I should pause and just ask if there are any questions um, about the detail. Council Member Elkins may have um, followed that, but I don't. I pity the rest of you. <laughs> Dan, I have a question. I um, so in in light of the decision by the legislature last year to um, be specific about the council's role relating to prioritization. Um, it, is it then the implementing agency's responsibility to prioritize projects? Um, is it their responsibility in conjunction with others? How does that go now in this post-2017? Well, I think I think that it, I'll, I will let uh, Emma correct me when I go wrong here, but it sort of reverts back to the procedure that was in place kind of before 2014, that the implementing agencies basically line up the projects that they want to pursue most heavily, uh, submit those for uh, in the order that they uh, want to pursue them, and hopefully they get funded. So it, it does fall on the implementing agencies uh, to do that ordering of projects. I think the difference now is that um, we'll have a more finely grained set of tools to make sure that whatever projects come forward have as much equity p content as possible. Mm -hmm. The only addition I would make to that is um, that while it was the legislature that, that changed the legacy law, um, it was really at the uh, request of the uh, local governments that, that this was really for them an issue of local control and um, and 
and so the locally the language was um, you know the project list will be submit, uh, accepted by the council as submitted <laughs> by the locally elected boards so I thought you did a nice job yeah. explaining thank you for that oh before we go to the next slide I just want to say there remains great interest in the council funding and equity grant program so that there would be specific activities, specific uh, facilities funded through this equity grant program uh, and uh, surprise, you know, new money is always welcome. So the fourth, um, uh, fourth strategy under this this uh, uh, policy is pedestrian and bike facilities should be coordinated between the regional park system and the transportation system. And so in other areas of your council life, you may run up against the regional solicitation and the regional bike transportation network. Um, the, the purpose of this strategy is to foster better coordination between regional trails and its funding and RBTN and its funding. Uh, knowing that some regional trails do provide commuting benefits, uh, and I will venture to say that some RBTN segments provide some recreational benefits, um, that we need to do a better job of coordinating between those two so that the whole adds up to a, a kind of better, uh, better use of public dollars. And since both of these are fairly newly funded and fairly newly expanding, this is just a topic that's appeared and become more um, more salient as the as more segments are are put into place. Um, we've also asked the implementing agency leaders from the parks to provide input onto the TPP update. Uh, and, and vice versa, we're hoping that the, the transportation people can provide input into the parks policy plan as we go forward through the through the summer. <coughs> Questions? Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <coughs> my comments are a little bit more overarching the four strategies that you uh, are highlighted in this presentation and also one maybe laser question in, on the front end uh, about so this is slide two talking about uh, the insights from previous discussions and opportunity to add your thoughts the council member work work group the regional parks implementing agency leadership and then the and then MPOSC you may have covered this uh, while I wasn't around but I'm hoping that the MPOSC has had an authentic, genuine opportunity to really voice their soul and their heart in this, good and bad, ugly and pretty, and all that kind of stuff, because that tends to produce better results when everybody gets a chance to chew on that bone. So I want to be sure that, because when I, when I compare this slide with the last one for the next steps, as far as where the rest of the input's going to occur, in the next steps, it doesn't jump out at me that MPOSC may have another swing at this. Mm -hmm. But I want to be sure I would encourage the process. And apparently, Councilmember Wolf decided to check out, not participate in this discussion. So I have to channel her, <laughs> but to chide her to be sure that she rides herd on that, to make sure that everybody gets a choice to a chance to really chew on that. Then, uh, just some rhetorical global thoughts. Uh, just thinking about this since I read this in anticipation of this meeting. It's a real challenge for you and us, what I would call balance when it comes down to natural resources. Mm -hmm. My compatriot here and I, I mean, just on Saturday during this crazy snow <laughs> event, monitoring email from our fellow birders about watching out for birds that are arriving, stalling, eating, etc., feeding them in a crisis. Mm -hmm. So he and I could go out and have a wonderful day, and I wouldn't want to see any one of you on that trail. <laughs> Other people, and I would claim that's a heavy use. 
other people on a different day would say, what are these two wackos doing out here? I want to ride my mountain bike and make all kinds of noise. So the balance challenge is from that nature deficit to nature fatigue, depending upon your perspective. So when we're only in, we're, we're not in the operating role, and that makes it more challenging for the planning part. We can do all the planning we want, but if the operating agencies say, well, this is how we're going to spend the money, and we're going to develop, and we're going to put four basketball courts next to a butterfly garden, you know, I would have heartburn about that. So it's going to require a lot of voices to be involved. And I know it's somewhat rambling, but there is some little method to this, this madness I'm talking about, because what's happening as historically, culturally, our city parks and recreation activities carried those activities. The regional parks were added. Mm. So as the region grows out to those existing amenities, I think people's expectations in the burbs, and this is going to sound extremely elitist, I think their expectations are, oh, the regional parks are supposed to pick up those activities. My bias is no way. It's a different experience. If you want that experience, go create your own city park. If you want an experience for a wildlife management area, be able to see endangered butterflies, you don't have four basketball courts next to the parking lot, next to the flower garden. So that's a, a diatribe thrown in there with some planning. But that's the challenge. If I were presenting to you at a, at a public hearing, is to say, be sure that these tweaks are going to allow for all that navigation and bone chewing and all that to occur because those voices need to be heard. But people need to understand what the role is of a regional park or multiple uses, multiple roles of various sectors of a regional park, like in Lebanon Hills, where there's a fantastic mountain bike trail, or I should say mountain bike area. But I don't want to see those folks. I don't want to hear them. Nothing. I want to be able to go out and see those birds. But they, that park is large enough to handle or accommodate both of those needs. But it's not or. It should be and. Thanks. Sometimes I take my binoculars on my bicycle. There you go. Uh, thank you, council members. One quick comment is I think that a concept that's near and dear to us at the at the uh, council is the concept of zoning. And I, I think yeah. that in a really crude way, that has a, a there's yeah. that's a real master planning has a has a, tries to do that job of of um, separating incompatible uses. Uh, the other thing I was just going to say is, um, I think when the legislature created um, the regional park system in the early 1970s, it was with the recognition that the state park system wasn't providing the nature-based recreational experiences that were close to home for, for the region. And they saw the region growing really rapidly. And I think that there was concern that um, we would lose these nature-based opportunities um, for our region. And, and in order to ensure a high quality of life, we, we needed to act. And so I, I, I feel like you're right on message. Um, the establishment of the of the regional park system is for the purpose of providing these nature-based opportunities. That said, there's still a real tension there between the provision of, of uh, recreational opportunities and the conservation of natural resources. But I feel like the, the, that the system is founded on these nature-based activities and that you can't separate the two concepts of conservation and high quality natural resources opportunities. Like they're interdependent, even though there certainly is a tension there. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's next? Um, we have, uh, d during the, the rest of April and May, we're gonna, we are writing, uh, busily uh, the update and um, we're looking um, in June to June 18th to take um, the CDC um, to release the draft uh, regional parks policy plan for public comment. Um, in August, there will be a public hearing at CDC um, and in October, we'll bring the final plan forward uh, for your uh, hopeful approval. <clears throat> So um, 
Do you have anything to add to that? No. That just sort of is the, the process as it unfolds. Councilmember Dorfman. I, um, just one question. So we're going to do this review and update and have a public hearing and approve any changes in this whole question of equitable use for everyone across the system is really important mm -hmm. um, and probably deserves more discussion. But then I'm going to go back, Dan, to your political point you made at the very beginning, because I want to understand how we're going through this process. But right up front, we said, hey, there's an election. We don't want to encumber the next council. What on earth does that mean <laughs> in light of this important work that you're asking us to do? Uh, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Council Member Gardner. Committee member Dorfman. Um, the I think the um, the reality is there is a certain amount of we are just taking care of business here. These are things that are required to do. We have to review this every um, every four years uh, to bring things up to date. Um, the uh, other forces that bear on the this council's work, the next council's work, we don't expect those forces will um, evaporate. Um, and so it's just a dynamic that that plans like this will always always uh, um, operate within. Um, the The heartening thing I think that 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 I've observed I was not highly involved in the creation of the last regional parks policy plan, um, but I did watch the discussion, particularly about equity, um, with a great deal of interest because it um, followed on the equity commitments in Thrive. Um, what, what's been really heartening is to hear the stories uh, from the implementing agencies and from some of the communities uh, that just having the topic in there has really uh, enriched the discussions and the level of uh, discourse about the uh, topic of equity in the different local communities uh, in different ways in different places but the uh, um, I don't expect that the issues of equity will go away in the region. I think that the next council has a great deal to um, add to that discussion, um, and we'll just see how that plays forward. I just, I'm just glad that we've carried it to the point we have. We got a long ways to go, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's an active, uh, normalized topic now. Thank you. I, I would just add, I mean, I think for those of us who sit on this council, we intend to, like, do our work until we're told we're no longer here anymore. <laughs> I have a question, uh, Dan and Emmett. Um, could you talk a little bit about between mid-June and, and August and then October? Um, you know, how are we intending to be engaged with the groups that Councilmember Chavez alluded to in terms of, um, you know, the many stakeholders who have a lot of different viewpoints about, uh, you know, uses and the future of the, the regional park system. How are we engaging um, those groups and how can committee members be part of that, um, that process? How can we support that work? Um, Mr. Chair, the great question. Uh, there's, of course, the, the backstop is always the formal public hearing, public comment process, and uh, people's uh, perspectives will be made known through that for sure. Uh, the um, We will be returning to this group and to the other uh, committees and MPOSC and, and, and venues as well as part of that. And discussions happening at all those places. We have had um, uh, quite a bit of public engagement uh, with different organizations. Uh, the implementing agencies are a clear one, but we've also gone back to folks we talked to during the 2014 plan creation um, to really revisit in terms of equity, uh, revisit in terms of uses, uh, and we've done survey work to complement the user surveys. Uh, and so there's a, there's a variety of work that sort of adds up to uh, 
mostly the same story. Like I think we've got the, the, um, I think we've got most of the issues out on the table, and people that are interested in them have raised their um, raised their hands or raised their voices, and and we're talking already. Uh, if you hear of anything, um, I would invite you to please let us know uh, as as comments questions come in. Um, but I guess those are the venues that we have set up at this point. Um, we've, we're trying to hit. We're also uh, uh, this month and next month going uh, to the Equity Advisory Committee to kind of talk over the process of creating the plan, uh, the plan update, uh, and seek their advice on some of the equity topics in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, both the boards were going out. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're also um, moving around to each of the implementing agencies, elected boards, or park commissions to talk about the update and, and gather their input. So uh, we have a number of, of things going. Mm -hmm. Great. Other, other questions, council members? Good. Well, I, I really I want to say, Dan, you made a comment about you know, the fact that this is every four years or so. Um, I just want to say that I, although we see some of this content more frequently, um, at least in terms of the cycle of working on the policy plan, um, this is clearly one of the core responsibilities of the council, and I'm really pleased that um, that we've been able to have this this discussion. So thank you for the presentation, the update. Um, I do want to say too, we've though while this is not a public hearing of any kind, uh, we did want to honor a request from Holly Jenkins, who represents a group called Wilderness in the City, to share some thoughts that she has about um, uh, investment of legacy dollars in the regional parks system. Um, so, Holly, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emmett and Dan. Thank you, John. You're welcome to. Uh, Share a few, a few moments of thoughts. If you would, introduce thank yourself you. for the no, record. If you can hear me okay, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Holly Jenkins, um, founder and executive director of a nonprofit, uh, Wilderness in the City. We were established in 2013. A group of citizens became very concerned about the future of Lebanon Hills Regional Park that continues to remain our base and our main um, concern. We view that park as an amazing gateway to nature and want to make sure it lives up to its full potential. But beyond Lebanon Hills, we have some a fair amount of interest in the entire regional park system because of the potential it has within our uh, metropolitan community. If I could just add a couple of comments in response to these, the, general, um, the presentation here. That first strategy point when you're asking how do you balance, how do you not impact nature when you're adding parking lots, one idea is porous surfaces. You can have environmentally friendly parking lot expansions. It doesn't have to be asphalt treated with salt in the winter. So there are ways around it if if we could get past this asphalt concept within our nature-based park system. Um, and, you know, Lake Billsby is getting some development on its beach because the water quality is so poor, people don't want to swim in it. So they're adding a splash pad and a patio on the beach. And I think a lot of people would like to see, and that was declared by the parks director to the county board. Um, and one of the county board of commissioners did say, why aren't we cleaning up the lake? And so those are the kinds of things that we should be really focusing on. I don't know how to make that happen, all these details within each park, but um, if we were looking at our park planning through a nature natural resource lens, um, I think that would help a lot with this concept of balancing. So with that, I will move on to my brief topic. This is mainly with regard to strategy four. So it's not necessarily related directly to the legacy spending, um, but it's that concept. It's the idea of connecting transportation planning with park planning through the use of commuter bike trails. Um, on that topic, I'd like to just read a few excerpts from a letter that was written to Dakota County in 2013 by the Minnesota DNR's Endangered Species Review Coordinator. At that time, Dakota County was looking to um, build a trail along the Mississippi River, the Mississippi River Regional Trail through Spring Lake Park Reserve. The DNR had asked them to avoid the, the particular bluff that they were looking at. 
Um, she stated that uh, the native prairie is a rare natural feature that merits consideration and management decisions. The purpose of this letter is to explain in more detail the importance of these dry bedrock bluff prairies and the reason we are recommending avoidance. She went on, and I won't go into detail. I'd be happy to provide this letter to anyone, but um, she just indicated and encouraged the county to take steps to avoid these bluffs, to work with the DNR to restore this area through, um, she had recommended brush clearing and prescribed burning. The community rose up and opposed this project. But despite the DNR's recommendation and despite community out that the community voices that were opposed to the project, Dakota County was able to move forward with this multi-million dollar project, which was managed by their transportation department. They used the explosives to cut through these valuable bluffs to create a bench cut. They were allowed to irreversibly change this landscape and further diminish a rare natural feature through this park reserve. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Spring Lake Park Trail. It's been talked about at length, um, but I want to ask stewardship as defined in the Thrive 2040 means in part responsibly managing our region's finite resources, including natural resources. So you sit there and say, how could this happen? And there's been plenty of finger pointing and it's not our role to tell them what to do. It's not our role. They decide they get to do what they want to do. But the truth is, it's the language in the policy plan that allowed it to happen. And it will happen again, because although there are many people who agree that that was a mistake, nobody seems willing to step up to the plate and change the language to eliminate something like that from happening again. And that's what I'm here for today, to help, to ask you to help revise this plan so that that type of project cannot happen in a regional park. These, these landscapes are just too valuable. Um, so when the legislature established the regional park system, it was not with the intent that these unique and valuable landscapes would be set aside to become future extensions of a growing transportation alternative network. But that's what's happening despite the inherent con conflicts. Now, livability, as defined in Thrive 2040, means increasing access to nature and outdoor recreation through regional parks and trails. As it's currently written, the Regional Park Policy Plan does not distinguish between trails planned for transportation and those planned for a recreation function. Instead, it integrates these two functions, leaving our parks open to having road-like commuter trails constructed through them. And similar to, you can say that people won't use them in that fashion, but if they're built to that speed limit, people will ride that fast. And if they use the type of fending for commuter bike trails, they do have to be built to certain criteria that requires this large construction projects. You don't get your meandering trails. You get a bike trail intended for commuting bicyclists. Um, so now the emphasis is being made to strengthen that in interlap, overlap of these two um, these two issues despite their inherent conflict, and that is quite concerning. So in addition, the process allows and in fact encourages implementing agencies to leverage funds, and as a result, we're seeing federal funds intended for transportation alternative networks being sought after to develop, to have these construction projects within our nature-based park system. And I understand that there's a lot of people who support and, and value the idea of leveraging dollars. It is a wise strategy. However, in this case, it's it's probably not such a good fit because of the negative impact to the natural resource base. So um, this also leads to an ongoing, oh, the, the idea of these commuter bike trails through the regional park system also increases the ongoing maintenance and funding expenses greatly. Currently, those are unfunded. You know, we're already seeing um, legislative issues that aren't necessarily living up living up to their ability to pay the 40%, and now we're just adding more expenses on top of that to take care of these commuter trails. Um, just that comes at the expense of other pertinent aspects of park management. So that really does have to be considered um, throughout this process. So our regional parks, as you stated, complement the overall system by providing every citizen with unique areas for respite and open space while providing nature-based recreation and education opportunities. This policy plan should provide guidance to help assure a legacy of healthy ecosystems close to home for future generations as intended when the regional park system was established. Toward that goal on this one issue, strategy four, um, as improvement to the policy plan would be to include language to distinguish between a recreation trail and a transportation trail. 
and within park boundaries, trails should serve a recreation function, which do not have those stringent construction requirements to accommodate community bike speeds. In addition, sources of funding for regional parks perhaps should not include federal transportation enhancement dollars. Um, those dollars might make sense for the trail connections between parks, but once you get within these valuable natural resource-based parks, the federal dollars really are a conflict there. And finally, and I know that's not going to be very popular for implementing agencies, but I'm more concerned about the park users. Um, and finally, any proposals for bike thoroughfares in parks should be reviewed by natural resource for natural resource impacts by a professional qualified ecology consultant prior to Met Council approval. So that when the MPAS gets this project and staff says this meets the criteria of the regional park plan, it's also supported by an ecology consultant that states, um, here's, here's the impacts, now you decide if this is appropriate or not. Um, so those are some of my thoughts on that one strategy. I have thoughts on all of them, but I'll hold off for now just to save you the time. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to comment. I have been engaged in this issue and on the regional park policy plan for over five years. And there is a lot of public support for the natural resource-based experiences in these parks. I'm not saying there's no support for the bike trails, but we know an awful lot of bicyclists who, who agree that those those parks are not intended for commuting bike trails. And I hope that you can help um, establish some language in this plan so that when the draft comes out, people don't have to come out like they did four years ago asking, you know, for reconsideration. So. Thank you I'd be very happy much. To answering questions or talk if anybody would like to discuss this issue further, but I um, appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Holly. You bet. Thank you for Thanks. your comments. Members, I think we'll go next to our um, conversation about the 2019 Community Development Division preliminary budget. Maybe he's going to change venues here. Heather, welcome. Mr. Chair, members, so even though it's only April, we are in the beginning stages of working toward the 2019 budget. So this is going to be our first opportunity to have a conversation about how we see the 2019 budget for the Community Development Division emerging is um, start to share some things that we're thinking about from the staff level, and then to get any thoughts and ideas from you as we begin this journey throughout 2018. So as we're thinking about putting the 2019 budget together, there's some families of uh, objectives that we're thinking about. So one is to support the ongoing implementation of Thrive MSP 2040, certainly including all of the work around local plan review, the Regional Parks Policy Plan, as you've spent the first part of this evening's meeting talking about, and the Housing Policy Plan. As you heard about at your last meeting, another key priority is sustaining the Council's ongoing work administering rental assistance through the Metro HRA. So these are the pieces that we want to be able to spend money on, balanced out by the key aspects of stewardship as we have outlined in Thrive. And some of what we and the financial thinkers in the council are interpreting this as is working toward constructing a balanced budget over four-year cycle, prioritizing structural solutions, so mitigating the structural gaps that we see over time, optimizing the impact of the council's levies, recognizing that those are a scarce resource that we want to have the largest impact with, and finally, maintaining the, the financial reserves consistent with the council's policies. So this is the type of balance that we're looking at as we're moving forward in budget development. So as we're looking at this, there's some budget considerations and pressures that we want to make sure that are on your mind. One is looking at the budget pressures facing the Metro HRA. Those of you who are at the last Community Development Committee heard the, Terry Smith's conversation about the pressures of rising rents, helpfully, not helpfully balanced by declining federal administrative fees, 
and some work that we're now doing as far as the Family Affordable Housing Program. That is the 150 homes that the council owns throughout the region and wanting to look at what the capital needs are associated with owning those homes um, that we've now owned for long enough that maintenance needs are beginning to be an issue. Another thing that we want to call out is around stewardship. And we'll be coming forward asking for additional staff for grants management. This is in the area that Heather is now overseeing for both the Community Development Division and Metropolitan Transportation Services. And she is identifying some additional need for internal controls in how we disperse grant resources. So there's an opportunity or a need to put some additional staff resources in this area. And then we want to highlight that there are likely to be some changes in some of the pass through funding that is embedded in the overall council budget. One is looking at will there be regional parks bonding in the bonding that goes through the state legislature. At this point in the legislative session, this is un unknown, but it's certainly something that we're monitoring. Um, both in terms of what will ultimately be in the council's budget and what the workload will be as far as getting bonding dollars out to the regional parks implementing agencies. The other key pass through piece is looking at the livable communities program and some of the changes that were in the budget amendment that you did not have the opportunity to pass earlier this afternoon. Um, and we have embedded some additional resources in some of those programs, continuing to use both relinquish, grant relinquishments as well as interest earnings to try and maximize those particular programs. So this is an ongoing place where there's some um, revisions to the pass-through as we're able to identify some additional resources to pass through to local governments throughout the region. So in terms of the overall timing, we'll be coming back for another discussion with the CDC about the 2019 budget in May or June. So we're still playing with some of the timing of when that will be. June 27th is the annual big picture budget presentation at the council level to get the high level picture of how 2019 is emerging across the council. August 8th will be the preliminary presentation of the 2019 budget, or the first presentation of the preliminary budget, depending on how you wish to frame that. August 22nd is when you, as the full council, will be asked to adopt the preliminary 2019 council budget and levies. October 24th will be adopting the public comment budget. And then December 12th, at the council meeting will be the final adoption of the 2019 council budget and levy. So in this overall budget development process, this is your first opportunity to ask questions, share ideas, share thoughts that will um, inform what staff is doing on this budget journey for this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the background. Pretty, uh, pretty stable. I think a lot of continuity in this, in this uh, prospective budget. Council members, do you have um, feedback or questions? Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. While one perspective <laughs> might be some stability, on the other hand, you know, to focus on the slide three, mm -hmm. when the conversation returns. Probably the, the richest conversation is going to occur at the tension points. So you need, I think, to my my request to you is to push us to focus on this. For example, next conversation we'll probably know the answer to the bonding for the regional parks. That's my hunch, or at least close to it. Uh, but as far as uh, dealing with the, the Metro HRA issue, and there are others, I think we're just gonna to have to be honest with ourselves is what the tension points are gonna be and we're gonna to have to make some decisions. So to help us ask us those magic questions like, well, do you, have, you wanna do this or do you wanna do that? And this is what the trade off is gonna be. An analogy back when we were working on, um, it's not, I forget what year it was in the journey, 
but I remember in the transportation we were kicking around planning for those discussions when one of us, and it was me or somebody else, throwing out saying, well, if we just have some pictures to say, this is what an interchange is gonna cost compared to if you wanna do this with X number of lanes. And it, it makes it much easier for us, I think, to understand what the difference is and what we're gonna get for the dollar. Thank you, Mr. Councilmember you. Dorfman. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> So after all the sort of national and local discussion about a week ago on the anniversary of the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, um, and I'm not sure how that will ultimately impact the budget, but I hope we have some discussions about our own fair housing initiatives that are embedded in some ways in this budget and take a, take a little bit of a look at that to see um, if we can make some changes regionally that will um, promote more opportunity for housing choice um, for people who you know can take advantage of the housing choice vouchers it just gets at the mobility issue and opportunity areas as well mm -hmm. Councilmember Chavez, can I ask, uh, is the work of the Metro HRA specifically the, the topic that you were referring no. to? You mean more broadly than that? No, just broadly, but that not is limited to. merely an example. Yeah. Because there are going to be others. Right. So I'm not confiding it to that. Yes. Just want to clarify. Yes, Libby. Mr. Chair. May I ask Councilmember Dorfman to say a little bit more? Yeah, no, I was afraid you were going to ask me to do that. <laughs> so, and, and maybe we should take this offline and you can help me frame this question. Um, but I, I read everything I could, could find around um, the Fair Housing and some of the analysis of how the Fair Housing Act has failed. And there were some locally focused issues that also mentioned the Met Council and our policies around fair housing and the FIC. And so I'm trying to understand, and it's on this list of, um, of agenda items in this, the background for this discussion today. And so what, what I can't do is say much more than that today, um, but I kind of want to understand how the policies we have here um, around fair housing initiatives that we're engaged at here, how some of the other policies we have around housing mobility and housing choice and trying to provide opportunities for low-income people to access higher opportunity neighborhoods, affordable housing and higher opportunity, how that all ties together for us. I mean, you know, because so many of those articles said fundamentally in so many ways the Fair Housing Act that, and, and there was a wonderful article by Mr. Mondale in the New York Times as well. He was instrumental in helping pass that 50 years ago about how it's failed. Um, and, and we know certainly in this metro region, we have huge disparity. Um, and so ultimately all these things end up being budget. You know, the, the budget so much drives all this. So. I'm still sort of obviously in the initial stages of trying to figure some of this out, but I, you guys know a whole lot more than I do, certainly. So I'm hoping we can have some of those discussions as we approach the budget this year. That probably doesn't help. <laughs> so. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Dorfman, that helps significantly. And I will put a teaser in that I believe at one of the Community Development Committee meetings in May, there will be a presentation on the Metro HRA's Community Choice Program okay. and the work that we are able to do with, unfortunately, a small number of households being served through the Metro HRA to expand mobility choice and opportunity. So perhaps I could um, point some of your interest toward that presentation and then see how that conversation leads to pieces around future budget conversations. Okay. 
Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Dorfman, the what you I think what you raised could be the subject matter for a two-hour council uh, committee of the whole session if, if it was really appropriately addressed to be fair to that subject because you're you know it's 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 a constellation of issues in that on the one hand you're talking about um, fair housing there are policy questions about uh, authentic policy and legal questions regarding our legal authority then if you move beyond that to let's put the law aside and let's talk about what we feel we should do for example and then where we to what extent are we going to place the money behind our mouth to go do that and then a function of resources to be able to go do that so there are multiple layers to that and to be fair to you i think and to that topic you could have a a tutorial, a, a workshop session of those who wanted to, to participate in that conversation to try to place place us on a baseline to say, okay, now I have all this story. Now what do I want to do with that story? Because it's, it's, it's a mini housing policy plan work group from what I remember of that journey. That's just my perspective. So I don't have an answer or a solution for that, but I'm saying what could be. Mm -hmm. I think that point is well taken. I, I mean, I, I I agree with you that would not be difficult to maybe, maybe a lunch, a, a brown one of your brown bag lunch conversations. Bring that back, right? Yeah, resurrected. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm flattered that you remember that actually. Councilmember Elkins. Yeah, I I think especially with respect to the housing choice. Um, voucher program we there are very definitely very serious budget issues that we have yeah. to wrestle with that but um, I, I think we could have a much broader discussion on this general topic that would go beyond budget issues mm -hmm. the well, article I really liked the last two weeks was Peter Coyle's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay well not, not uh, not a lot of pointed direction in terms of the uh, budget <laughs> development, but um, I think that's its own direction in a way. So, any final thoughts? I think I will also um, be sure to ping the members who are not here to make sure that they're that this is on their minds and that yep. they're giving us feedback. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Members, our last item, um, our last information item is um, an update on Land Use Advisory Committee. I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update uh, about the uh, meeting so far this year. There's been a couple of themes that have been largely consistent with um, past work, but I think continue to come into stronger focus um, with LUAC, and, and those are um, housing, um, uh, transportation and the, and the park system. Um, so just to take those individually, we had a, a, a good discussion, presentation of um, the land use and local planning um, changes to the, uh, the transportation policy plan um, from Cole Henniker. In January, we also had a very um, good session uh, uh, that Libby led um, relating to the governor's task force and housing. Um, which really, uh, I think, brought us into a, it's really a thread that brought us into our March meeting where we had some more conversation on housing in a couple of different respects. One was, um, again, Libby and Tara Beard together presented about how do we talk about housing um, and really kind of thinking about how do we message uh, around the need for different uh, housing of different price points. And that's really on topic for LUAC members who um, really over this whole period of my service on there have been articulating the need for just continued discussion and, and, and thought um, in, in tandem about, you know, how do we bring this to our communities and how do we defend against these very familiar um, criticisms about affordable housing in particular. Um, 
we also had a, a preliminary report um, of research that's been undertaken here, both by regional policy and research and also local planning assistance. I see Lisa's here. Um, a typology of change in suburban neighborhoods. And that's, I think, another great example of um, work produced in-house at the council that has huge application and potential for um, regional partners uh, of ours all across the region. So really an interesting um, discussion about that. And then finally, um, as we did earlier in this meeting, we had a, an update um, from Jan Youngquist about the Regional Parks Policy Plan and um, really engaging LUAC members in that um, discussion as well, which I think was, was really well received. So that's a little bit of an update of our, uh, our work in the last two meetings and um, got a very full work plan to uh, proceed with for the rest of the year. I don't know if you have any questions or feedback, but. I think we're down to one vacancy as well, so feeling really good about the, the group. It's a very, it's a very good group. Yeah. So, Councilman Ralkins, in, in, in the discussion of uh, you know some of the the, the local government barriers, what, what, what's the tenor of that discussion? You mean as it relates to housing, particularly? Yeah. You know, I think the um, the focus, uh, at least in this most recent meeting, was primarily about. Um, uh, frankly, the political challenge as opposed to, uh, you know, entitlement challenges or uh, kind of the development process, per se. Um, I think the entitlement challenges are political challenges mostly, aren't they? Well, that's fair to say. That's fair to say. Um, but, I mean, the, the topic that I think you, um, you, you've raised consistently and, in, 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 you know, and eloquently about the mismatch between uh, planning and zoning is not something that we dove into particularly in this most recent discussion. We've had some conversation in the past about that. Um, Olivia, do you have anything to add about that dialogue? Mr. Chair, Councilmember Elkins, what we've we've definitely been seeing a different conversation about housing in the last. 12 to 18 months than we were seeing previously in that there's more attention right now on the lack of housing choices in more parts of the region. And so we're hearing from more places and more voices than we've heard recently. And I think an increasing, increasing recognition right now that the lack of affordable housing options is affecting really affecting the employer community right now mm -hmm. in a way that we hadn't heard <clears throat> recently. And so it's kind of, it's we're trying to capture this new interest in these conversations. And Ms. Cheryl, also add, and the Family Housing Fund is also hiring a researcher from somewhere in Virginia who's doing some of this work, I think together with you, Libby, and the Council sort of focused on the business community and employment and housing. I think because we passed something <laughs> last week. <clears throat> okay. Councilmember Wilkins, do you want to say more about the piece that you were alluding to earlier that Peter Coyle wrote? Because I think it's so directly related. Well, I just yeah, the, the Builders Association um, has been frustrated for a, a while now about. Uh, uh, the difficulty of uh, you know, securing in entitlements that uh, seem to be promised by municipal comprehensive plans and uh, it's where it's a bait and switch situations basically where the comp plan says well I can build multifamily housing on the site and then but the zoning has not yet been conformed to, to that comprehensive plan and when the developer goes to get a to get the, the, the zoning brought in line with the comprehensive plan, the city denies the, uh, the, the zoning and instead changes the comprehensive plan. And it happens often enough that it's become a big issue for them. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, they, you know, they have the, you know, the builders even for single family homes has this, this product that they'll refer to as um, villa homes. It's basically, yeah 
close to a townhome, but it is, you know, separated homes, but on small <coughs> lots relatively close together. And where they're allowed to build it, it sells like hotcakes. But you know, they can't build it anywhere in the region without a plan unit development, which means riding down the, the mile-long razor blade of uh, the en entitlement process for every single project. Mm -hmm. That's, that it shouldn't be that way. Right. Okay, well, um, I think that kind of concludes my update on, on Blue Egg Matters. Unless there's any other business, I guess I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you yeah. for attending this evening.